What's going on, everybody? We get a jam-packed session today. Uh, on the collective, we have John Heck, who's assistant strength coach at UNC with uh, UNC football. So um, obviously, uh, football is in this guy's blood. Uh, his dad is a coach. His brother plays in the NFL. Uh, so you know, we, he he really dives deep into what he needed to do and kind of how he needed to analyze the situation when he started to feel his priorities and desires shift a little bit uh, from being a football player and a four-year starter at UNC and potentially you know going into the NFL draft. Um, and then realizing that he actually wanted to be a coach and how he handled that situation. He also dives pretty deep into the student athlete mindset, what they're going through uh, and some of that decision-making process. But um, along with some nutrition, I think this, this episode is jam packed. So enjoy it. Let's get it going. All right, welcome to this week's episode of the Samson Strength Coach Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Grasso. We are here with John Heck, who is an assistant football strength and conditioning coach at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, he has been at the University of North Carolina for quite some time. He was at D1 Sports Training prior to that, and he was an intern with the Carolina Panthers. Were, were inter- was it an intern at the Carolina Panthers? Was that- yep. Okay. Um, he's got his bachelor's from UNC in exercise physiology, exercise, and sports science, and his certifications. He is a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the NSCA, as well as a certified sport nutritionist through the International Society of Sports Nutrition. There's a lot of a lot of sports in there. So, um, John, welcome, man. Super pumped to have you. Like we were just we were just talking for those for the listeners, obviously. Before before we started this podcast, um, you know, John and I know, uh, you know, JC Hall, who's also been on the podcast, Miles Brown, who I'm trying to get on the podcast. Um, so, you know, a couple connections there. And I really appreciate John stepping on here and uh, obviously a little bit short notice. John's recently married. So we were trying to get this done a little bit. But I, I felt bad. I was trying to get you on the podcast, like around the time and you were like so willing to hop on the podcast during like you know, you're getting married, I think that's Saturday or Sunday or something like that. And then you're going, I'm like, I'm like, man, I should, I shouldn't even be bothering this dude. So I, I appreciate you, you making the time to come back around and, and get on with us, but uh, welcome, man. How's everything going? Absolutely, man. Psyched to be on. Things are going great here. Um, we've got a pretty relaxed schedule here right now over at UNC. We just finished up spring ball a few weeks ago. Uh, nice. We're in kind of our discretionary period. Guys are taking exams. So uh, one of the rare times of year where we actually have a little bit of downtime on the strength staff, um, getting ready to get things cranked back up here for summer training in, in about two weeks. Yeah, yeah, big deal, big deal for sure. Yeah, that may that may like period I think is is pretty uh, savory for all the you know football strength coaches who work in college football. It's like the one time a year where there's actually uh, you know emptiness in the in the in the in the facility. You know, it's just some downtime there. I know it's like a time where you could like go into the locker room and be like, wow, like, there's actually nobody in this building. Like if I want to listen to some really loud music while I'm showering today, I got a chance to do that. No one's gonna bother, no one's gonna bother yeah. me. But um, <laughs> enough of me and my uh, my own personal habits that I used to employ at UConn. Um, let's talk about you, man. Like what tell us your story. I obviously I mentioned some of the places that you've been and whatever, but uh, you've kind of created somewhat of a, a decent media presence, social media presence, at least from what I've been able to see. So why don't you kind of take us through where this journey started and kind of how you've transitioned through to where you are now and, and what you're doing now at UNC? Yeah, man, for sure. So I uh, I started off as a player. Um, I played here at UNC. I was an offensive tackle, uh, you know, as a four-year starter here, and um, I had a, a pretty solid playing career. Um, but in my time playing football, you know, I, I grew up in a football household. My dad, uh, he's currently the offensive line coach for the Kansas City Chiefs. He uh, had a 12 year NFL playing career himself. And, um, you know, he's been uh, either a player or a coach my whole life in the NFL. And then uh, my brother, Charlie, he's uh, the starting right tackle for the Houston Texans. So uh, football is was certainly in my genetics. And uh, like I said, grew up in an offensive line household. Um, but, you know, over the years of, of playing, I kind of, I started to realize that that football, playing football wasn't really my true passion. You know, it was always something that I kind of just did because my dad did it. I was big. I, I was, I was good at it. Um, you know, it, it never really seemed like there was an option not to do it. Um, but as I, uh, you know, continued to, to, through my college career, I kind of just realized like, this isn't really what I love to do. I, I don't really have a passion for playing. Um, my real passion was in the training. Um, you know, the the summer conditioning, the summer lifting, you know, for me, that was kind of my in-season. Like, that was my favorite time of year by far. That's when I had my most competitive fire. You know, that's when I was really just, like, selling out as an athlete, I felt like. And then, you know, I spent the whole in-season just looking forward to the off-season again. Um, so going into my senior year, I kind of made the decision. I was like, you know what? 
my passion truly is not in playing the sport. My passion is in the training side of things. And I don't want to, you know, go into the NFL and start my actual professional career uh, doing something that I'm not truly invested in. You know, I, I wanted to just go ahead and start doing the thing that I love and that I felt like I hadn't really been able to do for the past several years because my entire life was dominated by football. So going into my senior year, I made the decision that when the season ended, I was going to hang it up. Uh, I was not going to do pro day. I wasn't going to do the senior bowl, no combine, no nothing. I was going to get right into strength and conditioning and right into uh, competitive powerlifting. Um, and I mean, that decision, that's a whole story in and of itself. You know, everyone in my life knew me as a football player. Um, you know, all my friends were, were teammates or former teammates. Uh, pretty much everyone, you know, when you're, when you, when you're a D1 athlete, you're kind of in this bubble yeah. where just kind of your entire day, your entire year is just dominated by football. Mm -hmm. So to make the decision to get out of it was, that was kind of the, probably the biggest turning point in my life. Um, not everyone understood the decision. Um, but anyway, my first gig out of, uh, out of college was at D1, like you mentioned. Um, that's where I met Miles, um, who, who you mentioned as well. And um, uh, spent a year there and then um, got hired by the Carolina Panthers. Uh, worked for Joe Ken at, at Carolina. That's where I met JC. Mm. And, um, you know, he was probably my, my biggest mentor in strength and conditioning. You know, Jay, you know, me and JC can tell you stories from that year. That was, uh, it was kind of baptism by fire for me as a strength coach, you know, going from a player to, to working at D1. And then all of a sudden I'm on the floor coaching the NFL guys, working for the legendary Joe Ken. Um, so I had to, to grow quickly. As a coach, I learned a lot that year. And um, then from there, a, a job opened up at my alma mater here at UNC. So I uh, interviewed, got the job, and, I, and I've been here ever since. And then, uh, you know, my, my personal life, I, I compete in powerlifting, compete in strongman. I've uh, been on a little bit of a hiatus here lately, just dealing with a pretty substantial nerve injury. Um, but I'm kind of, uh, you know, starting to turn the corner with that. I'm, I'm hoping I can uh, compete here again soon. And then um, I also run a, a, a coaching and nutrition business that's that's largely uh, driven through social media. Yeah, that's awesome. That was a, that's a hell of a story. I, I do want to go back and obviously if you're if you're comfortable with kind of touching on, you know, I didn't realize how deeply the you know football obviously ran through your family and you know obviously it's awesome that your you know your father and your brother are operating at that level. So but with that said, like you said, it must have been pretty challenging, right? When you kind of got to the point where it's like, all right, I need to let everybody know that this isn't necessarily, you know, even though it's in my blood, it's not necessarily the path that I want for me. Um, like, what was like, can you kind of take us through a little bit more like that transition and that kind of like that dialogue? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what was that like? Like talking to your family, talking to your friends, like, hey, because I'm assuming at that point you had a decent path ahead of you, right? Like there was the, the trajectory was probably what you would want it to be if you wanted to pursue football as a career, right? Yeah, you know, I, my last two, I was a four-year starter last two years at, at UNC. I was, you know, all ACC. Um, I was a projected fourth, fifth rounder. Um, so I knew if I pursued it, you know, I had a shot at the next level. Um, and I I'd kind of had it in the back of my mind for a long time. I kind of knew that you know, I didn't quite have that burning drive to be a football player, that, that love for the game. And, um, you know, being a, being a D1 athlete's tough. Like there's, especially on the offensive line, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. You know, I can remember like my, uh, my, I started as a redshirt freshman and, and, you know, second game of the season, I'm going against uh, Jeremiah Tachu at Georgia Tech, who went on to be a second round draft pick that year. He's a great pass rusher. And, you know, we're playing them and, and I get a holding call against him that calls back a touchdown. I get on the bus after the game. We lost. And I'm getting, you know, on Twitter, John, you know, screw John Heck. And I'm using using nice terminology for what was actually <laughs> John Heck, this, John Heck, that. And, you know, I was 19 years old. And, you know, it was little moments like that that just kind of soured the experience for me. And suddenly I I felt more pressure and kind of anxiety around it as opposed to that like love and that drive. Um, so as the years went by and as I got closer to graduation and as I just got older and more mature and kind of started to figure out, you know, where my own passions really were, um, 
you know, I started making that decision in my mind, but actually pulling the trigger on it was, was terrifying because I knew once I did that, there's there's no going back. Yeah. And I knew that leaving football was going to change my life completely because up to that point, my life had been football. Mm. You know, like I said, when, when you're playing at that level, I mean, 20, your, your entire year is dominated by football. Mm. You know, we're, we're there in the summer, we're there in the spring. It's a year round commitment. And, uh, you know, I think everyone, when they, when they start playing college ball, they have the aspiration to go to the NFL, you know, so to the thought of telling people like, Hey, I've got this opportunity and I'm turning it down when right. so many people around me would, would kill for the opportunity. You know, I, I, it, I felt guilty in certain ways. Like, you know, I was just kind of squandering this opportunity that so many people wish they had. I felt like I would be letting my dad down who had been such a mentor to me yeah Um, you know he's an NFL coach and um you know all of his co-workers that I've gotten to know over the years that knew me as a football player they kind of assumed I would just continue down that path Mm -hmm. so I I remember like working up the courage to have that phone call with my dad to tell him that I was making that decision I mean I probably spent like two hours sitting there with the phone in my hand like going over my mind like what am I going to say to him Right. You know, I had no idea how he was going to react and his opinion to me meant more than anyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, but he couldn't have been more supportive of it. You know, I think a lot of dads out there, you know, try to live vicariously through their son because they themselves never reached any high level of, of sport. Um, so, you know, they try to be the hard ass coach on their kid. Well, my dad was never like that. He was never that, you know, coach to me. He was always a dad first and, and a mentor and always just, you know, very constructively and positively encouraged me and taught me, um, you know, when it came to football. So he just, he, and he's, he had played in the NFL. He had reached the highest level. He didn't need to live vicariously through his kids. Um, So he was supportive of the decision. He just wanted me to be happy. He knew that I was going to be going into something that I was passionate about, that I had a plan. You know, I think so many guys, they get out of football and it's like, don't, they've never, they, they know that football is going to come to an end someday, but they haven't like truly set their life up for that next step for life after football. So fortunately in my case, I was able to leave football on my own terms and had a plan in place. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to go in strength and conditioning. Um, and I'd already kind of started, you know, getting my foot in the door with, with, with internship opportunities and, Um, so I was fortunate enough to be able to kind of seamlessly transition right into a job, uh, or, you know, an internship right after football, which a lot of guys don't, you know, they get out of football when they're 28 years old and then they're kind of starting from scratch. Uh, but, but the transition was tough. Um, you know, you go from this team environment, um, you know, this, this structured life to, all right, now you're on your own. You don't have football anymore. Um, but. I got right into competitive powerlifting. So Mm -hmm. I still had that, you know, that competitive sport to chase after. And I, and I loved it. Like I said, the, the training was always my real love. So I I dove right into that. uh, um, And I started doing what I love, which was, uh, you know, coaching in the weight room. Um, So it, it, it was a relatively easy transition for me. Once I, once I really got started, it, it was just a matter of getting all the people in my life on board with it. <laughs> right. Um, one thing, uh, quick, quick, did you, um, did you train with a crew when you first started competing in powerlifting or did you kind of just like jump into it on your own and you kind of were just like, all right, I've got some thoughts and ways that I could go about programming. And then what, what like federations have you competed in? Yeah. Um, so I, I was pretty much training on my own. I, I wish I had a crew, wish I had a, a training partner. I think mm-hmm. having a training partner that can really push you is, I mean, it's huge. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the most underrated aspects of, of training is having a training partner. Yeah. Uh, but early on, no, I didn't. I, I trained pretty much alone, although I was working with someone who uh, a very close friend of mine um, who's currently a Ph.D. student in, in exercise physiology, who um, he himself was a powerlifter. He kind of got me specifically into powerlifting and um, into the programming of uh, of powerlifting. So he uh, he programmed for me initially. Uh, um and then ever since then, I've, I've always done my own training programming. You know, I, I just love 
love the the puzzle of programming and experimenting yeah. and tinkering with it. Um, but once I got into and with powerlifting, I I competed in the uh, USPA Federation. Oh, nice. Um, but after a few powerlifting meets, I I got into strongman, um, and I'd always wanted to get into strongman, but you know I didn't really know where to start. Like I didn't know, I didn't know where to get the equipment. I didn't you know know how to how to start from a coaching standpoint because no one had ever taught me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we uh, when I came back to UNC after working with the Panthers, um, there's a, a gym in downtown Raleigh, about 20 minutes down the road called spider strength and it was owned by a a pro strongman mm. um, it was you know pretty much a strongman a gym for strongman competitors powerlifters olympic weightlifters um so i went over there there was a, a group of strong guys uh who were, who were training for strongman training for a show and i kind of befriended them hopped in with them and then started training with them um and then for the first time i really did kind of have a little a crew to train with yeah. um and then That's once awesome. i started doing strongman then i i immediately fell in love with that and then um that's where i've kind of been competitively ever since yeah it's interesting the strongman stuff is interesting i think it's like sometimes i think people enter the powerlifting world thinking it might be <laughs> something a little bit more than what it is and especially like former athletes right like strongman kind of provides a little bit of that stimulus like scratching the itch of still feeling like you're um doing doing something that requires your body to have to like exert itself in some sort of like I don't want to use the word like movement pattern ish style, but like there is like, there's a little bit more of a, you know, an intensification in that regard. Whereas, you know, the competition lifts are simply just the lifts themselves, right? Like it's so weird going for like, I feel like for athletes, it's like, well, the competition at one point on the field, I mean, there's so many variables, right? Where it's like, now I'm going to go compete in powerlifting where it's like the actual lifts are just that, like, that is what I'm competing in is those lifts and everything is you know, revolving around those particular lifts. So um, I, I agree. It's funny. My, my transition was pretty similar, <clears throat> excuse me, like as soon as I got into um, I well, wasn't similar at all as far as like I wasn't a D1 athlete, but when I when I transitioned into powerlifting, um, and I stopped playing sports. I was just lucky enough, like you said, like be around involved around a crew um, up here in Connecticut. Uh, you know, Vincent Desenzo and TT McRae, like these guys are benching. These are, I mean, Vincent Desenzo is in the powerlifting Hall of Fame. I mean, obviously he's you know elite FTS. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah. You know, so I'm like, oh, like, I didn't really know who he was at the time, but you know, my mentor was like, hey, you're gonna come train with us in this crew on Friday nights, and I was like all right, cool. It was like five or six dudes. And they're all just like, you know, they all look like you. Right. And they're just like, <laughs> or like, except they're like 400 pounds. Right. And you're like, all right. And then, um, you know, I always thought that was like my first actual internship, even though it's not on my resume, it was just like understanding the concept of like loading plates, keep your mouth shut, like absorb, you know what I mean? Not necessarily that, that not saying that's how all internships should be, but that was kind of how it was or old school, you know what I mean? And it was like, all right, cool. So, um, yeah, I was like super fortunate to be able to actually have like you said, a different lens. Like, yeah, it's like, you're getting motivation. Like I'm a pretty like internally motivated dude, but when you're around other people who are obviously pushing weights, like, you know, five times what you can lift and just the different lens that they're looking through. I mean, they're like to get like coach coaching, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's so it's, it's different. You know, I feel like for, for a lot of athletes, once you stop getting coached, your whole, your life kind of changes a little bit. Like you said, like you were all like, there was probably no shortage of people trying to offer you information while you were a division one athlete, right? Like everyone's trying to get their hands on the athlete. And then once you're done playing sports, it's like, Oh, no one talks to me anymore. No one really cares to impart wisdom on me. Right. You're not, it's not in totality, but in, in general, you know what I mean? Cause it's just like, well, like what kind of value am I providing? You kind of, like you said, you kind of like, ah, I'm just on my own now doing my own thing. So I think powerlifting can provide that in that same way, shape or in some way, shape or form where it's like, all right, I'm getting coached. I'm competing in something still. So there I'm scratching that itch. And then obviously strongman and all the other, um, you know, weightlifting disciplines and, and things like that, or, you know, people to get into jujitsu and other, you know, different forms of martial arts, it's like the, the, the form of, you know, competing, and, and, get, and I, you know, kind of go back to your, your father, though, what I do think is interesting is I wonder if because of the fact that like your dad and your brother play at such a high level that there's almost like this because you mentioned the fathers who like really try to live vicariously through their kids. And I would imagine there's some sort of insecurity there that's present because of the fact that they may not have been able to live up to the expectations they have for themselves, which is neither here nor there, like no, no criticism at all. I mean, I, I get it. Like people are you know, humans are humans and we're going to feel those things. Um, but I do think it takes a special type of person when your father or your mother is somebody who's actually confident and secure enough in their own mind to know and that I need to provide, I need to utilize sport for what it 
can be utilized for, for John, right? It's like, okay, for John, it's like, this is the route that we have set out and we're going to utilize sport to provide structure, discipline, uh, competitive nature, overcoming adversity, right? Like there's all these avenues that sport offers us and, and as well as any other thing that we get involved in. Um, so I wonder if because of the fact that your dad played at such a high level and is operating at such a high level that he's like, I understand more about what sport actually is and what it's supposed to be, right? And so this is what John took from it. And this is where he's at in his life. We've utilized this and taken this route. Now, now his route and his avenue to better express his thoughts, his skills, his abilities is going to be through the art of coaching, strength and conditioning and, you know, sport performance. Would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, he, he'd been through it all. He understands that, you know, it's not all fun and games when you get to that next level that, I mean, when you get to college, it's a full-time job. He understands the demands of it, the anxiety and pressure that comes with it. And then plus at the point that I was at, when I made the decision to, to stop playing, you know, I had just completed a successful college career. I'd gotten my degree and I was going on and becoming my own man at that point. Yeah. You know, I was going into the professional world and, you know, he wanted, he wanted me to do what made me happy to carve my own path. And I think there was always a little part of me that now my dad never made me feel this way himself. It was always from outside people who I think there was a part of me that was just tired of being seen as like, Oh, Andy Heck's son, Andy Heck's son. Like, Oh, you're going to fall in your dad's footsteps. I'm like, no, I, I want to, I'm just John Heck. I'm doing my own thing. Like yeah. I, I'm not just his son. I, I'm my own man. And yeah. uh, I think, that in part kind of drove me to want to carve my own path and, and really do my own thing and, and make a, a name for myself as opposed to kind of feeling like I was always living in my dad's shadow. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, for sure. And when you, when your dad was playing and coaching, were you, did you travel a lot as a kid or were you always in North Carolina or like how did yeah, that? No, I, I, I'm not from North Carolina. Um, oh, okay. I consider myself to be from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, okay. Yeah, I was born in Seattle when he was playing for the Seahawks. Before I was a year old, we moved to Chicago when he was with the Bears. Uh, he finished out his career with the Redskins, so spent some time living in Virginia. Then he got his first coaching gig with UVA, so we moved to Charlottesville. And mm -hmm. this this all happened, you know, between I was born and, and fourth grade. So a lot <laughs> of things uh, very yeah. early on in my life, and then. Uh, second half of my fourth grade year, we moved to Jacksonville. He got a job coaching the O-line with the Jaguars. Mm. Uh, and then I spent, the, my family spent 11 years in Jacksonville. So mm. that's kind of where I grew up. That's where I consider myself to be from. Uh, went on to UNC to play football. And then uh, after my first year here, my family moved to Kansas City. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, quite a, quite a bit of moving, but we were fortunate enough to be in one place for the majority of my uh, majority of my childhood. <laughs> yeah, the majority. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a lesson. And I guess like my question now is like, you seem to obviously establish yourself at UNC, right? And but you know, early on throughout your entire childhood career, you're probably thinking, oh wow, is this this is what football is like. We're bouncing around. We're moving around. There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of uh, turnover, I guess I should say, right? There's a lack of job security from time to time. And so did that kind of like influence your decision or did, like where, where, where were your thoughts on that when it was like, all right, like I could probably, I don't know if it's either, you know, more or less, you know, chaotic as a player or a coach, whatever the case may be, it's probably, you know, equal in some regards as far as job security goes. But um yeah, like what was your thoughts? What were your thoughts on that when you're watching your dad kind of like bounce around from, you know, place to place? And then obviously your brother is getting involved as well. And you're kind of like, all right, you know, where do where do I see myself as far as like, you know, wanting to settle down? Well, I mean, growing up, you know, something I, I talk to people about sometimes who don't really understand this is I never. I never got to experience football as like a fan, you know, growing up, it was always my dad's a coach. If the team loses, he's getting fired. We have to move. <laughs> right. um, so, as, you know, most kids, they grow up kind of idolizing their favorite football player, cheering for the local NFL team or college team, whatever. For us growing up, it was, there was always that kind of like pressure and fear and like stress surrounding football season because, you know, we'd be watching my dad's games on TV and my mom's stress because, I mean, we all know the importance and the implications of what happens if we're losing. Yeah. Um, so we never grew up watching football as a fan. So I think 
that's kind of part of what shaped my views of football was growing up. There was always kind of that like stress surrounding football that every year wondering, Hey, is this our last year here? Am I going to have to move and leave all my friends and, you know, seeing my mom stressed out about it. And, uh, you know, and, and when my dad was coaching at UVA, I mean, the, him being gone recruiting all the time, just seeing that, you know, seeing the demands of, of the coaching world and, you know, kind of what that does to a family. Um, and my dad always handled it as well as anyone possibly could have. He was always a great dad to us, a great husband. But mm. I mean, we definitely grew up in, in that environment and understood, you know, the, the, all the sides of the business. Um, mm. So I think I, that kind of shaped how I viewed sports and football, you know, from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I think it's like, yeah, as a, as a strength coach, you're probably like, all right, I know I probably won't have to deal with recruiting as much, but yeah, recruiting on the college level for any sport coaches. I, I, yeah, I don't know how these guys do it sometimes, you know, I'd watch the guys come. I mean, it's like you finish, we finish a season and it's like, they're already hopping on a plane and getting, you know, we're not even coming. They're not even coming back to the facility from the last game. They're just going to wherever they need to go to for their, for the next location to, to recruit. And it's like, you know, and gone for three weeks, come home for maybe a couple of days back on the road. You know, it's like, I don't know. You know, it's, it, it is tough, it, but I'm glad, obviously like in retrospect, I like, I, you know, I was saying in the previous podcast I've done, it's like really, you know, you don't dictate whether something was a mistake or a success based on the outcome you, you do, you know, based on the information you had at the time will dictate, you know, whether it was a, the right move or not for you. And obviously at the information you had at the time was like, I'm not feeling like this is the route for me. And I want, like you said, you want to become your own person. So um, would you say kind of moving into the next question, like, do you think that that's something that, motivates you as a coach right this is almost like this do you, do you have this like I mean I don't want to like you know speak for you but I do wonder it's like all right so the question would be what motivates you as a coach and like how do you motivate your staff and the people that are surrounding you but I do I have to wonder like, like there's probably a decent amount of motivation that may come from the fact that you know you went a little bit of a different path than what everybody kind of expected of you so I'd imagine there's probably some maybe not but maybe there's some hunger in there every single morning you wake up it's like I kind of need to prove to the people who like supported me in that process that like they were right you know what I mean like prove them right as opposed to prove people wrong kind of thing you know what I mean like I think people no still, doubt. you know yeah, yeah to I, touch mean, on I that, definitely yeah. had I mean definitely had a chip on my shoulder in that regard I mean a mix of both wanting to prove my supporters right you know prove my dad right um for supporting me and then like prove some of the other people wrong who who you know did not agree with my decision and you know I obviously turned down a good bit of money, you know, potential money um, by, by not pursuing the NFL. And I mean, you know how it is, especially early on in a strength and conditioning career. I mean, you're not making any money, um, but you know, I, for the first time ever, I was doing like my own thing. I was <clears throat> doing what I loved, what I was passionate about. I wasn't following in anyone's footsteps or living in anyone's shadow. I was doing my own thing. Um, and that's something I've, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder early on, like, hey, you're like, yeah, I want to establish myself. I've taken the, my own path. Now I've got something to prove. Um, and, you know, I was, like I said, I was doing what I love. So I had this drive to, to be better, to learn more, to be the best coach I could be, um, to, to, you know, walk the walk and set an example myself with, with, you know, the approach I take to training and the effort I put into training and programming to, to show the guys that I coach here, like, hey, I'm not going to ask you guys to do anything that I'm not going to do myself. I'm going to, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, take this mindset and approach to training if I'm not going to do it myself as well. Um, and then, you know, as I've gone through the years in this career and, and, you know, climbed the ranks a little bit, gotten more experience, gotten better, you know, started to experience some success, you know, it's just more and more motivating every season to continue to push things to the next step, next level. And, learn more and add to my toolbox, become a more versatile coach. And, you know, I've got a drive and a hunger for, for what I'm doing now more than I ever have in my life. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. And that is, that's kind of what I thought, you know, I thought in some regard, it's like, I think people focus so much on like proving people wrong who like doubted them, you know what I mean? But I think there's like, well, it's a lot more people who probably stuck their neck out there for you, right. In order to try to get you to where you wanted to go and kind of understand yeah. as like, yeah, this is a big deal. He's making a big transition in his life. You know, it's, it's just tough. Yeah. I mean, there's been, 
I couldn't be where I am today with, I mean, there's so many people who have helped get me to where I am today. I mean, so many connections I made along the way. And like, I will, I, I don't look back with any regrets on my playing career. You know, I, although I'd kind of lost my passion for it and decided to get out of it, I'm still so grateful for the experience I had at playing college football. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had some of my lowest lows in my life playing college football, but I also had some of my highest highs. Mm-hmm. You know, some of my best friends in my life were my teammates here at UNC, and, and some of the greatest moments of my life were, you know, winning some of those big games and, you know, just grinding through, you know, practices and training camp with, with my teammates. And, um, you know, I, I was given so many opportunities. I, I wouldn't have a degree from UNC, you know, if I hadn't played here. And uh, I probably wouldn't have, you know, had my opportunity with the Carolina Panthers if I hadn't played here, if I didn't have the connections and, and network that I, you know, built as a football player. Um, yeah. So, and, and I think playing at this level definitely kind of prepared me early on. I knew how things work in the facility. I know, I know the business side of football. I know I lived it as an athlete. So I know what these guys are going through. Um, And and I think all those things have really, they've helped me get to where I am. And then they've helped me be a better coach. Having Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we should definitely touch on that, but that was kind of my next question actually. It was like, you know, given the experience that you have and given the fact that you're somebody who made the decision to move into training conditioning based off of the, you know, sort of changing desires and changing priorities that you had in your life, it's got to be, I mean, the connection that you're able to create with these players. Is, I, know, I know like when you played and right now, I, the things are always changing. I get that. And I know the college football landscape is, I mean, it's heading in a direction right now where like who, who really knows what the future holds. It's definitely a lot different than it was five years ago and 10 years from that. Right. So, um, but I would imagine that you guys have established a pretty, pretty good connection. The players feel like they can come to you obviously to discuss these things because they're probably not comfortable telling a lot of people that, you know, I bet, I bet there's a good amount of guys. I don't know if a good amount of guys, but there's some guys in there who are like, is this for me? You know what I mean? Like, is this, is this my thing? You know what I mean? Cause I, I'm being told it's my thing and I think it's my thing, but like, it might not be, you know what I mean? There's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. Like you said, they're probably experiencing their lowest lows and their highest highs, just like you did. Um, and that's an emotional battle, right? So how, how have you kind of gone about navigating some of that and you, you know, you're, you're in your current role right now at UNC. Yeah. I mean, having played myself and, and, you know, especially played offensive line, I think that does allow me to, you know, connect with these guys in, in ways I otherwise couldn't have. And then also, you know, nutrition is very important to me. And that's kind of, you know, part of my role here. Um, so I showing some, you know, some of our big guys, especially like, Hey, you can be an offensive lineman and be lean. You can be an offensive lineman and, you know, transform your body and be in great shape and, and you know, have great relative strength so you know I, I like trying to set an example for some of our guys like hey you can do things uh you can physically develop in ways that you otherwise maybe thought you never could have mm-hmm. um so you know having played i it's it's definitely been a big advantage being able to relate to some of these guys you know i think gain their respect in certain ways um you know i certainly don't think it's prerequisite to be a, a football strength and conditioning coach to have played uh, but I, I do think it does give you some good insight, particularly having played at this level, just understanding what they're going through just from a stress and anxiety perspective and, you know, the demands of their life in general, the demands of school, of meetings, of practice. So, you know, understanding that there's so much going on with them outside of just, you know, in the weight room and on the field where, where we get them. Yeah, that's so, you know, been big. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And why don't, so why don't we get in a little bit of what's going on with you at UNC? Obviously, you have a passion for nutrition. You have a passion for training. Um, why don't you kind of talk us through some of the things, maybe, you know, current or past where you've really, you know, kind of gone deep down the rabbit hole and things you're really passionate about and things that you'd like to really, um, you know, impart on. I think everybody's got like these these things. It's like, I really want to I want to provide education to my athletes. I want to make sure that they have a good, you know, student athlete experience. Um, you know, we were constantly trying to like search for ways to increase our knowledge base or impart this wisdom. Right. So um, what are some of those things for you? What are some of the things that you're really passionate about and kind of how have you gone about implementing some of that stuff with the athletes at UNC now? Yeah. I mean, if I could just one thing, you know, right off the bat that, that comes to mind is the nutritional side of things. You know, I think a lot of these guys, these players, um, 
most players can buy into training. You know, they, they enjoy hard training. It's kind of ingrained in them. They're used to that sort of pain and the discipline that's required to do 6 a.m. workouts, to go through tough conditioning and all that. It's kind of part of the football culture. I think what tends to be a big missing puzzle piece for a lot of these athletes is the nutritional side of things because it's a different sort of discipline and a different sort of discomfort that you have to go through to uh, when it comes to nutrition compared to training. You know, and, and I try to tell these guys, I'm like, listen, we ask you to push yourselves out of your comfort zone in so many ways. We ask you to, you know, sit through hours and hours of meetings. We ask you to, you know, show up early in the morning for grueling conditioning. We ask you to push yourselves incredibly hard in the weight room and in practice. You know, we ask so much of you and you guys are so used to pushing yourselves out of your comfort zone, embracing some suffering and some pain. I don't think nutrition should be looked at any differently. I mean, it takes a certain amount of stepping out of your comfort zone uh, and, you know, suffering to to follow a consistent diet plan to not drink and binge on food and pizza on the weekends, to turn down certain foods that you're normally used to eating. Um, just kind of that monotonous consistency and the preparation that goes into the nutritional side of things. I think that's sort of a discomfort that most guys aren't quite as natural at embracing. Yeah. And a lot of these guys, especially at the higher levels, I mean, these are genetically gifted freaks. And you know, I don't want to say any sort of training is going to get them better, but I mean, a lot of these guys, you keep them healthy. If they sniff a barbell, they're going to develop, you know, yeah. you know, you can train that there, you look around the country, there's so many different training programs and you still see the gifted athletes, no matter what they're doing, they're developing, they're getting right. bigger and stronger and faster. They're freaks. They're, they're mm. freaks are going to freak. Um, yeah, 100%. But when these guys when some of these guys really add the nutritional puzzle piece to the equation that just takes things next level and then you know for a guy like me I was obviously gifted in, in the sense that I'm six foot seven I've got the frame um, but I wasn't necessarily just that freak naturally gifted athlete um, so when I really dove into nutrition and made that as much a priority as I was making my training, that's when I really started seeing my body transform. That's when I started really getting strong and adding muscle and, you know, getting in great shape. And that's when I really started physically developing. And that's what took me next level. So, you know, I think if more of these guys could put the same level of effort and willingness to step out of their comfort zone into the nutrition as they do their training as they do football practice uh you know that could be something that really takes these guys next level yeah for sure and so when it comes to the nutritional aspect of things obviously you, you said you have you know kind of a side company that's you know influenced through social media um what are some of the like base principles that you've tried to really impart on some of your current athletes that you feel like are, you know, obviously super applicable things like, like you, you, like you obviously already alluded to, like a lot of these athletes are not, it's a different type of discipline. So what, what are some of the things knowing that you were dealing with a collegiate athlete that you really tried to push to them and, and develop as like pillars, I guess you could say of um, their overall nutritional approach. Yeah. I like to just, you know, have the guys focus on one small change at a time you know I'm not going to try to you know talk these guys into snapping their fingers then all of a sudden they're eating like a bodybuilder eating you know six meals a day and chicken and rice and all that but just starting with something as simple as let's get you eating consistently eating four solid meals a day you know I think a lot of these guys tend to under eat um, and, and that's the tends to be the issue with most people when it comes to nutrition is they've got to suppress metabolism because so many people eat, you know, two meals a day. And, you know, a lot of our guys here, like, will be, you know, it's, it's noon and they, they haven't eaten yet, you know, or, or they come into morning can, you know, our morning field work and they haven't eaten breakfast. Um, so, so many of these guys, they eat very sporadically, inconsistently throughout the week. And then on the weekends, it's going out, it's, you know, binging. Um, so just finding, starting by finding some sort of consistency, let, let's start by eating four meals a day, 
where every day, you know, you know you're, you're meeting a protein demand. Um, every day, you know, you're getting some consistency with your calorie intake. You know, let's start there. And I think that's gonna make a world of difference right out of the gate. And once you get used to, you know, eating a little bit more frequently, once you get used to giving a little bit of thought to, okay, I, I've got four meals a day, I've got a hit, how do I need to kind of, you know, roughly time this out to make that happen? What do I need to do preparation wise to make that happen? Once you start getting your foot in the door there and, and just developing, you know, having that in your mind, making that part of your routine, then you can start to get a little more advanced with it. Then you can start diving into getting a little bit more in depth with food selections themselves and, you know, getting into macros a little bit, um, you know, for some of our bigger guys with, you know, bigger metabolisms, maybe even adding in a fifth meal, you know, just, just, but just starting there by getting a little bit of consistency with some form of an eating schedule, I, I think is a great uh, start. Yeah, for sure. I think, it, yeah, that's, that's always like the, the the best start in my opinion is like build a meal, like understand how to build a meal, like what it should consist of, you know what I mean? And let's at least just, let's just start with like three to four day and like making sure you actually develop some sort of structure around it. So that's awesome. Um, when it comes to just to, I'm going to, you know, we'll go with this and then I'm going to kind of like preface off this, but the, the actual, um, like resources that you use to try to provide. So like, obviously you can use like your own resource and I'll, we'll give a chance to like plug that at the end, but the, like, where do you turn to as far as like books, podcasts, references to try to like gain a little bit more knowledge about, you know, your performance side of things and your nutrition side of things. Like what are, what are some of the things you might be able to kind of offer some of our listeners as far as informational resources? Like I said, it could be books, podcasts, could be people, right? Like, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, it could be your own internal exploration, right? You probably explore a decent amount on yourself about yourself, you know? So um, what would you say is kind of like your, your go-to for some of that stuff? So I have really, if you can get a chance to, you know, work with another coach or shadow another coach, physically see what other coaches are doing. That's really been, you know, kind of my favorite way to really uh, gain some other perspectives. So like from the nutrition side of things, what I've done for the past four years is every year I have worked with a diet coach. Um, I've worked with a pro bodybuilding coach and I've gone through a full diet with them. I, I've gained their perspective. I've learned, okay, you know, what are their nutritional philosophies? What are their supplement philosophies? And, you know, all of them do it a little bit differently. So in personally working with diet coaches, kind of going through it myself, kind of learning, you know, what do guys have to go through with this? How does, how does this make me feel? How does this affect my training? How is this affecting my body? You know, actually experiencing it myself and personally experiencing different perspectives and modalities. Um, that is how I have gained the vast majority of my nutritional knowledge is just, you know, a hands-on approach. Like I'm going to go through it. And uh, from every coach I've worked with, I, I've taken things that I like. I've taken things that I don't like. I've kind of, you know, started to form my own philosophies there. And uh, my own philosophies are now influenced by so many different people. Um, and then when it comes to training, just, I love, uh, you know, visiting other facilities. I love, you know, gaining perspectives from, from different sports, different aspects of the, the strength and conditioning world, you know, working with strong men, working with power lifters, working with bodybuilders, uh, working with, you know, working with strength coaches in the NFL, in the college level, in the private sector, you know, just personally being around those guys, seeing what they do, how they coach. Uh, I've gained, you know, I think so much more perspective and insight that way, as opposed to just, you know, simply reading books. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that would be my, my biggest piece of advice would be, you want to learn about dieting, work with a diet coach. You want to learn how, uh, you know, maybe to incorporate some strongman training in, into a football setting, go work with some strongman competitors. Yeah. You, know, you want to learn, you know, some different ways to elicit a hypertrophy response, you know, go talk to the bodybuilders. Yeah. You know, I think just gaining perspectives from all the different disciplines of what we do has given me, you know, some versatility, uh, um, you know, in my toolbox. Yeah, I think that that's great advice. And I think that that's really under underrated advice. Actually, I think there's there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of good information out there for sure. Um, but I do think that it brings a different element when, like I said, like when I was, 
you know, I think having my first exposure, like when I first started coaching, right. And I was like, just kind of hanging out at this facility. My mentor is like, Hey, first things first, uh, you're going to compete in a powerlifting competition. And I was like, what? I was like, I, what do you, like, what do you mean? And he was just like, yeah, he's like, I was like, I don't really care what your numbers are. He's like, let's just pick something like six weeks out or whatever. And you'll start training with our crew and you'll just have a better understanding of this particular discipline and what your athletes may be feeling when it comes to like psychological hesitancies, physical hesitancies, or any sort of like a competency that you need to overcome adversity, whatever, he's like, just, just go through a couple of training. And then you compete like a few times after that. And you're like, you know, you kind of get an itch for it yourself. But I think it was that experience alone. It's like, do I take a lot of like powerlifting like style concepts when it comes to like training athletes? Like, maybe maybe more than i think you know what i mean i don't know there are some like roots in there for sure as far as like technical aspects and things like that but ultimately like you said it's like it's just a different perspective like take as many perspectives as you possibly could find that's really interesting though that you would actually work with you know somebody who's a, a nutritionist and just to get a different perspective on them um i'm actually thinking about doing that myself i, mean, I just like reach out to someone like hey man like i'd love for you to just kind of like take me through like i don't know let's work together for like a year you know i think that's another underrated piece of it too is like you know, you want to find out about something like don't don't just like stick with it for like three to four weeks and then move on to something else like dig your feet in. You know, if you want to really learn about someone's work and really understand it deeply, stick with it for two to three years and then move on to something else. You know what I mean? Like take as yeah. much as you can from that. And then, you know, here at UNC, when, when we're writing our programs, um, you know, when we're thinking about implementing a, a new movement or a new warm up or a new ex exercise, whatever it may be, you know, as a staff we'll train it ourselves. Like we'll try it out ourselves. And, you know, some of our coaches on staff here will, you know, go through the entire training week that the guys are doing. So it's like, Hey, we've experienced it ourselves. We can more effectively coach and cue certain movements because we've done it ourselves. We've trained it. We know exactly how it feels. And it gives us some perspective on the, you know, kinesthetic awareness of body positioning of gives us some insight on the, okay, how to properly cue this when we're coaching it on the floor. So, you know, I think it's also a great thing if, you're going to be programming for athletes train that yourself you know go through that yourself a little bit it's going to give you a lot more insight onto how to properly communicate that to those athletes if you've gone through it yourself yeah absolutely um no, I appreciate that. We're coming up on about an hour. So I just want to get a couple more questions. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you got a little bit going on here. Um one I guess two questions I have. One where do you kind of think, you know, given your pulse on the industry and strength and conditioning in general, what do you think from based on what you've seen, where do we need to go in order to kind of continue to establish ourselves as coaches, as professionals, um, whether it be, you know, I, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll leave it at that. Right? Like, where, where do you, where do you see this going, right? Like, what are some of the things you, it can be administratively, or it can be actually, you know, specific just to the staffs, um, the coaching competencies, like, what do you, what do you, what would you like to see in order for this industry to continue to move forward? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, a lot of that kind of depends on where you're at. It depends on, you know, the staff you're with, um, I think strength and conditioning coaches have a lot of value. And I think um, being able to really have a staff in the building where the football coaches, the strength and conditioning coaches, the athletic trainers, the dietitians, everyone's kind of on the same page. Everyone's working cohesively together. I think there's programs out there where the different departments are kind of butting heads where, you know, we were you know, sports science is becoming so much more relevant and such a big thing in strength and conditioning. Um, but then there's, you know, football coaches who are kind of resistant to it. They don't want to modify practices or, or modify, you know, the reps that certain guys are getting based on GPS data. You know, I think um, oftentimes there's kind of a disconnect between uh, the athletic trainers and strength and conditioning staff when it comes to return to play, when it comes to dealing with the injured guys, when it comes to modifying certain guys, I think, you know, sometimes there might be a disconnect with, with the nutritionists and the strength coaches and the athletic trainers. I think if there can be a little bit more cohesiveness between all the departments in the building to where, you know, you look at the NFL, a lot of the teams, uh, you know, the strength and conditioning models it's kind of shifting more to this medical model where they've got these performance staffs where it's like the strength and conditioning, uh, a sports scientist, nutritionist, a head athletic trainer, and they're all lumped into this kind of performance staff. They're all working cohesively together. Uh, you know, they're not hired necessarily by the head football coach. They're hired by the organization, hired by the GM. 
or the athletic director and they're they stay there long term they're able to work with the players uh long term where whereas there might be more turnover on the coaching staff you know i think just being able to develop more of a cohesiveness consistency between all the departments getting everyone going in one direction where everyone appreciates the value that the other departments bringing where football coaches trust and see the value in the, in the sports science, in, in the, the rehab process, in, in, you know, allowing the strength coaches, the trainers, the nutritionists to, to do what we do. And then us, you know, us trusting the football coaches, trusting the trainers, I think just getting everyone more on board, moving in the right direction and being able to incorporate all these new cool things, whether it be GPS data, you know, force plate analysis, you know, movement screens, whatever just kind of getting everyone going in that same direction. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah, no, I, I, I hundred percent agree. And I, that's honestly one of the best answers I think we've had on this podcast, obviously, because it's something that, although it sounds simple in nature, it's complex. You're working with a ton of different humans who have a ton of different perspectives on things. But I think if, you know, understanding the reality is that like the investment that a lot of these athletic directors want to make in the student athlete, they should probably also make in the individuals who are supporting and protecting and creating resilience within that student athlete. So, um, you know, hiring individuals who are obviously willing to, have a ton of bandwidth, I think, like within the concepts that they understand, you know, it's like, I feel like you can understand a concept super, you know, super well, but like, if you don't understand it so deeply to understand like how to kind of move in and out of it and be flexible with it, then I don't think you truly have a good grasp on it. So I think getting a bunch of individuals who are just creative, curio- you know, curious and, and willing to work with others uh, in a cohesive manner is, um, is, would be, would, you know, definitely move things in, in the right direction at least at least create more dialogue more discussion you know what i mean nothing nothing bad is going to come just having more conversation around things um so like i said we're coming up in about an hour i want to give you a chance if you want to kind of let everybody know um you know where they can find you uh, as far as like you know your instagram social media any work that you've done that you want to plug um you know if, if you want to put your email out there any way that people get in contact with you obviously if they have questions for you uh, and then obviously the nutrition stuff that you're doing on the side and company and everything like that like you know, so, uh, you know, just let it, let it rain, a shameless plug, just let it, let it, let it fly. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Um, best way to contact me, get in touch with me is, is through Instagram right now. I've got a, a website in the works. Um, but right now, if you shoot me a DM on Instagram, I'm uh, at what the heck 71, what underscore the underscore heck 71, uh, shoot me a DM there. I generally respond to all those. If you're interested in, in nutrition coaching, or training programming, you can reach out to me there. And like I said, here in the new, uh, near future, we'll have a nice website up and running and, and that's where business will be conducted. Uh, but if you go to my page, you can work with me. Uh, I post a lot of content on what we're doing from a training perspective, both with the football team and what I'm doing with, with Strongman. I post a lot of mobility and nutrition stuff on there. So uh, yeah, check me out on Instagram. Yeah, that's awesome. John. I guess my last question would be, and I've been trying to like, I'm try- I got to start reminding myself to come up with more of these like fun questions to end off the podcast. But for today, uh, a lot of the you know people that I work with, I've been asking, like, hey, what's what's your three, what's your top three in terms of movies? So why don't we, why don't we go with that? That's, that's one I was, I was, I feel like you can tell a lot about a person by just getting their, their top three movies. And it's tough. Top three is tough. Like if I was to give you five or eight, you know what I mean? It's a little different story, but if you had to narrow down your, your top three, like movies that you know you that john heck is throwing on if he's got you know three movies left to watch what are what are they going to be shawshank redemption mm, great. uh the green mile nice. and uh yeah two stephen king yeah uh stories there and then um the last samurai that's one of my wow tom cruise throwback yeah, I haven't watched that in a long time. Actually, I might uh, I might have to check that out. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. those, are, those are three good ones though. Those are three good ones. I was I was expecting like football movies and everything like that, but I, I, I appreciate the, the cliche stereotype. <laughs> I remember the Titans, and Friday Night Lights, <laughs> program, yeah, and Sunday. No, I uh, honestly, I mean, most sports movies kind of make me roll my eyes and how they portray it. <laughs> It's it's unbelievable how like it's it's funny like I I have trouble watching not only sports movies but just like professional sports in general like after you work in sports it's almost like you know I like my fandom and like my overall like emotional attachment to almost anything that has to do with sports is like so minimal like I I don't even watch the draft like people are like hitting me up like who do you think the Giants are gonna take you know we're all Giants fans up here I'm like I don't know dude I don't know so it's like I don't know but um 
Hey man, I really appreciate this. I'll uh, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit, but I'll shoot you a text ring to get some uh, get your um address. We can send you some gear and stuff like that for doing this. Absolutely. But appreciate it, man. This is awesome. Uh, wish you the best of luck, obviously, with everything going forward. Let's definitely stay in touch, and I'll keep you know, um, you know, just following your stuff, man. You obviously have great content. You know what I mean? It's super funny too. I like it. It's pretty creative. Who's your camera guy, by the way? Like, who's the guy? Like, this is incredible camera work. <laughs> uh, my wife, for the most part, actually. It's either it's either uh, the tripod, my wife, um, and there was a couple of videos. I did a collaboration video with uh, my friend Graham, the, the yeah. barefoot sprinter on Instagram. He's got his own videographer. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, t- tell her she's doing a, an incredible job. Tell Graham. Yeah, you, you tell him. I was like, I was like, the first thing I noticed, I was like, I don't know anything about art, but I was like, that looks sick. Like, this is very creative. This is cool. So, yeah, keep doing your thing. Um, again, thanks again, John. I appreciate it. And uh, for the listeners, we'll uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Yes, sir. Appreciate you having me on. All right. See you, John.